Uh, hello and welcome to Digital Futures uh, tutorial session on G code basic for the 3D printing with the Grasshopper. Uh, my name is Lamila My name is Lamila Simisic Pasic, and I have a pleasure to introduce you, Professor Diego Garcia Cuevas, our today instructor. Hello, Diego. Diego hello, is Lamila. Hi, Diego is CEO and founder of the Control Med office located in Madrid. He has a master uh, in uh, biodigital architecture from Universitat Internacional de Catalunya. He's also teaching at the School of Architecture, Universitat Europea Madrid, and he is a visiting professor at IAC Barcelona and San Pablo CEU Madrid. Diego is authorized Rhino instructor and co-author of the book Advanced 3D Printing with the Grasshopper. So in today's session, in this tutorial session, uh, we will get the chance to uh, understand and uh, learn more about how to transform the design into the series of the curves and parts for 3D printer to use, as well as how to write and create G code directly within Grasshopper without the use of the scripts or plugins in, a, in an easy format for existing Grasshopper users to understand. Um, this uh, tutorial is based on the book that I already mentioned, Advanced 3D Printing with the Grasshopper. Uh, Clean FDM, uh, co-written by our today's uh, today uh, uh, tutor Diego and Gianluca Pugliese. Sorry if I pronounce wrong. It's That's fine. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, for the audience who are um, uh, follow this tutorial uh, by the YouTube. Uh, we, uh, you are welcome to post your questions and we'll uh, try to address them. Uh, before uh, we start with, uh, uh, with our today's session, I would like just to briefly introduce you about the coming events on Digital Futures. Um, uh, we have a young talk uh, organized uh, for the 5th of October about the DALI Me Journey and the Dream Studio. Also, we will have 28th of October, we will have a, a Spanish talk about the relevance of uh, on emerging technologies in Latin America. We will as well have a, a Portuguese talk about the digital urbanism. And as you already uh, know, every Sunday we, from the 25th until 27th of November, we have like 10 sessions of the digital consortium. Uh, for tomorrow, uh, we will have a session on distributed consciousness by Memo Atkins. So tomorrow, uh, try to save the time for this uh, talk. Uh, and I just want to briefly tell you that we uh, have one uh, more open young call for the uh, topic experimental 3D printing with the custom materials. So uh, the presentation will happen on 5th of November while the submissions are until the 25, 21st of October, sorry. Uh, so, um, Diego, now the screen and the floor is yours. I'm welcoming you all from the audience on YouTube and the audience on the Zoom. So please, Diego, now the screen is yours or the floor is yours as you wish. I would but, like, I would prefer the floor, but let's go with the screen. Okay. <laughs> what we can do. Okay. So let me just stop sharing my screen and now you can share your well thanks a lot lamila and bablin yeah. for the presentation and for the opportunity to be here at digital futures it's something we, we were trying to organize in some some time ago right now and we couldn't find the time but finally uh, i'm super happy that we could find a moment and we can have this tutorial session for uh, all these people that uh, seem like uh, they are interested on in doing something different with Grasshopper probably, no? So I'm gonna share my screen. 
And this presentation that we have in here, there we go. Okay, so uh, the aim of uh, this two hour uh, conference, let's say, is to learn like the basics on G code creation for uh, with Grasshopper for 3D printing. But for that, uh, I would like to explain a little bit the path I follow until I understood a little bit about what is D code, what is 3D printing, and how to take control over, over this technique. No? Probably some of you are already experts on 3D printing, some of you are experts on uh, Grasshopper, some of you work with uh, robot arms, and some of you uh, don't know anything about this. So maybe for some of you, this content is already familiar, you're familiar with it, or some, for some others, it's completely new. Let's see, you can give me feedback at the end. Also, uh, you can submit your questions on the chat and Pavlin and Lamila will tell me. So if there is any important question, you can stop me at any moment, okay? Well, I'm gonna introduce myself first. This is, uh, I'm Diego. It says Professor Cuevas on my Instagram profile, but uh, because it is a new brand that I'm developing. Professor Cuevas for uh, projects and design. Okay. It is uh, the name comes basically because uh, I used to teach a lot. I used to teach a lot. So I have uh, three open, let's say, fields or brands in my life right now that are uh, control mat and the University, European University of Madrid, where I teach at uh, architecture and at the master course at the very end that I'm going to show you a little bit about it. In my Instagram profile, I usually post like the stuff that we do with the students or projects that I do from time to time. For example, I have to post a couple of projects that we did in the last months. Those projects that take a lot of time you know, until they are finished and so on. They're not posted even that they are finished. So uh, if you want to know a little bit about what I'm doing in general, you can follow the profile and there you can, you can see what we're doing. Well, Control Mat, is my company. It is a company for uh, teaching. It is a mix online and on-site training company. And we train on uh, basically parametric design. We used to train also VIM, Revit, and so on. But now we're just focused on Rhino and Grasshopper for parametric design. Also, I teach at the university, first year till, five, till fifth year. It is super interesting to go back to first year no, and see how uh, people, the students are interested in architecture, but they don't know anything. And you have to start from scratch. What is a line? What is an elevation, a plan, a section? And then you go step by step and they're introduced into this world. Uh, it's super interesting to go from the top, I mean, from the, top, from the parametric complex design suddenly to the, to the very lowest bottom of, of everything. No? It is like a good exercise if you can do it sometimes. And also I teach at a master course, uh, it's master in architectura at the same university. So uh, because of Bologna's plan in Spain, when you finish architecture after five years, you have to study one more year. So you can have your own practice architectural firm and sign your own projects. Okay? So I'm gonna explain a little bit about control mat. We have like three parts, training, projects and fabrication. Training are the courses on Grasshopper and Rhino. Projects are the projects that we develop because we are architects. As uh, Lamila was introducing myself, I said I was a, an architect. I studied a master course in biodigital architecture at uh, Barcelona, where I met Lamila. Lamila is also an architect with the same master course uh, we met there. We had a, a lot of uh, good time there during that master course. It was super interesting, super useful. And that was the first step of everything for me, at least. And so the training, the projects that we develop and the fabrication basically are based on that master course because there we learn like the basics of mm, biodigital design, let's say, and digital fabrication too. But when you want to study something like that, usually you have to enroll in a university and it takes a lot of time as it took for us, like one year or one year and a half, two years, sometimes three years, depends on. And they are like, uh, not very expensive, but 
according to the time, you have to spend more time. No? And so what we did at, uh, at ControlMath was to create a course like an express master on parametric design, no? something that would be for maximum four months and try to concentrate the maximum knowledge on tools for parametric development of architecture, design, and so on, uh, into that small uh, period of time with the idea of going after to another master course at a university, for example. But then you take the tools with yourself. It's like with, if with this master of, on parametric design we have here, uh, the hybrid edition now, no, because it is not all on site due to COVID still. Uh, it's like if you get the, a bag with tools, parametric tools, to go to specialize yourself in another thing, in another type of master course. No? So in this course that we have, that was the beginning of everything, uh, there are like two parts. In part one, it is more theoretical. It is online about the grasshopper, Python visualization, kind of personal projects. And the part two is here at the practice where I am. Is this place where we have uh, mini machines, uh, 3D printing, laser cutters, vacuum formers, and some other machines, so every, every kind of manual machine, etc. Uh, kiln for the clay. And, and there, the students come and can put into practice the stuff that they were developing during the first part of, the, of this master course. And so if they were doing a project on a pavilion, Maybe they can make a small mock-up of the pavilion at a very small scale or at a medium scale. Sometimes we do furniture design, we do any other kind of things with, uh, with the tools uh, at a scale that is kind of interesting. Like, for example, there you see the, some girls from last edition milling some panels to assemble uh, this piece of furniture. This is a part two. In part one, there are many instructors. I am as an instructor. Also, my colleague Sergio from Control Mat, Arturo Tedeschi. If you if you're familiar with this world of parametric design, maybe you know the book AAD from Arturo Tedeschi is like the big bible of uh, parametric design. If you really want to learn that uh, good, that that would be a very, a very interesting link. Bavlin, I know if you're still there, if you can, you could share a link to the yeah, book. Yeah, sure. To I'll, the, I'll do okay. that. A, okay. A, AAD by Arturo Tedeschi, that is uh, like the best source to, to learn Grasshopper, no? from my point of view. Obviously, there are many tutorials online, many companies, many things, but uh, the, always a book is, is more, it's very interesting because if someone puts the effort on doing a book, it's because that has to be well done. No? Also, we bring the Caramba developers, the Car Caramba is a plugin inside Grasshopper for uh, uh, structural analysis. Uh, Andres Gonzalez, it's awesome. He comes from McNeil, from Miami. To, he's the worldwide director of Rhino for the part of uh, fabrication. Uh, Gianluca Pugliese, that is the developer of WASP for Spain and Portugal. Aman from Creative Mutation. Would be awesome, uh, Pavlin, if you could, um, for example, share some links about uh, for Control Mat, for Caramba. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing that. I'm on it. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Create, creative, creative mutation in, in, in Instagram. We also visit, for example, Nagami. Uh, Nagami is uh, probably is the most interesting company of uh, robotic 3D printing worldwide, or at least in Spain. <laughs> uh, they have like, I don't know, five, six, seven robot arms, and they print furniture for uh, big architects like uh, Saha Hadid and some other. No? So we usually visit our friends from Nagami. We learn from the robotics a little bit there. And so, so Nagami is also a super link to share. Uh, these are some projects that the students develop during the course. These are images of their, of their projects. These are some pictures also of the projects that they construct here with us. And Apart from training, this is very interesting because probably some of you are thinking on teaching or living on, on, on your knowledge on, on parametric design. No? Maybe you're already an expert. You say, how can, what can, how can I do to, to work with this? Do I have to go to an architectural firm 
and that's all. And then you get paid and you do what they do. What they tell you, not really. I mean, there are many, many companies that need consulting. Consulting means that they need to develop uh, a system uh, to, to, to develop their own products, but they don't need you to work there uh, full time. It's a matter of two weeks or three weeks just to help them to develop some part of the project. And so here we have some pictures. I wanted to bring some pictures of companies that hired us in order to uh, develop the project. For example, that helmet you see on the bottom right corner, it's because this was a company that developed helmets for motorbikes and they were developing them with uh, Katia. Katia is a very expensive software, very professional, probably is the best one for nerves and surfaces, no? The, mo the most developed one, but it is also too expensive. And so they were a small company, like five, six people, and they wanted to see if the same things that they were doing with Katia, they, they could be done with Rhino and Grasshopper. And we showed them that they could be perfectly done. So we did a training on that, on their products, with ours, with that software, with Rhino and Grasshopper. And then they moved into this software that is uh, much more affordable, no? and they were super happy. Or the chairs on the top is for a company, Actu. You could also share a link to Actu, A C T I U. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they are like uh, super professionals doing furniture design, and now they wanted to do like something a little bit different based on parametric design. Also, they wanted to develop. Um, like the soft parts of the chairs, but developed according to where more pressure is and less pressure in order to 3D print them inside, blah, blah, blah. Something like a kind of more technical than what they were doing until now. Or the one on the picture on the bottom left is uh, are some drawings that we did for a luthier of violins, a person that makes violins, because uh, uh, using a milling machine, it will be much easier and much faster for him to, to develop more pieces in the same period of time. But that, it does not mean that using machines, he has not to work by hand. He, will, he has to do the finishing by hand for the perfect sound and so on, but doing it in Rhino first and then milling 90% of the boot with a mini machine would uh, be much faster for him. No? Also, I brought here uh, another picture, other pictures of a project we did, uh, I think maybe two years ago. Uh, the project is from some architects, but they wanted to develop some ribs for the entrance. This is a mall in Valencia, in Spain. And they wanted to do these ribs. The ribs, I have to say that they were done. I mean, they managed to do the ribs in grasshopper and so on, but they didn't know how to put everything like flat for manufacturing, for production with the water jet cutter. So there we entered us, and, and then what we were doing were uh, to put every single piece, because you can automate that process, you can script that process to put every single piece uh, flat, then design the structure that was going to go inside with the dimensions and everything, because it was going to be all different, and then to split it into parts uh, for, the, for the machines that had to, to cut that, those pieces. These other pictures uh, were a consulting we did for a company for infrastructure, basically tunnels for high-speed trains. This was interesting because this company is in, in Madrid, I don't remember the name now, <clears throat> but um, they didn't work with Rhino. They worked with AutoCAD and many other software as usual, but they got involved into a project in Switzerland where the company in Switzerland was working with Rhino and Grasshopper, and they need to know some Rhino software in order to deal with the uh, files that the other company was sending to them for prototyping and production. So it was super interesting because they were experts on this. I, I have never done uh, precasted concrete rings for high-speed train, obviously. So they tell you what they need, and then you adapt the tools, the same tools for the development of this kind of stuff. No? So it was like super interesting because also you learn a lot from these companies. And that is a very good uh, way of living, no? giving these consultings to other, to other companies. As we have digital fabrication tools for the students and some projects, we also provide digital fabrication services. So some people, when they need to meal something like a terrain, a model, a mock-up, uh, many kind of things they ask us and then we develop those 
those works if we can. For example, there are some that we could, like the ones on the top, and some others that we couldn't finish because we don't have the technology. For example, the one on the middle bottom, uh, we did the models in 3D, and then we developed the pieces uh, as flat surfaces for a water jet to cut them in uh, steel. So we did, uh, because we received from the from the sculpture, from the girl, we received like a mock-up made with plaster, if I remember. And then that we had to put that into proper geometry to unroll all those surfaces and give them or provide them to the manufacturer that was going to work with CNC, in this case, with uh, water jet cutters. The one on the bottom right, this is a very famous artist, at least in Spain, uh, even that he's worldwide, it's Okuda, Okuda with a Q. Maybe you can share that link, uh, Berlin, about Okuda. Uh, we have done small collaborations with him. In this case, he sent us the mesh, the 3D mesh. Remember, imagine that this is a 3D mesh, the one on the bottom, on the bottom right. And then you have to unroll it, number all the pieces. They have to assemble everything, paint it one in, uh, in a different color, etc. No? The one on the bottom left is another artist. We work a lot for artists. Artists need people that know the technique and that have the tools because maybe they have an idea. They say, I want to get something like this, but I don't know how the machine works. What are the limits of those machines? So it's, it's, it's super diff difficult with the artists because they come with an idea and then you have to approximate the maximum possible, the possibilities or the capabilities of both the software and the machines in order to get the closest to the idea that they have. No? So that is from... Uh, uh, friend, uh, uh, an artist, uh, Belen Zaera. More models, mockups, as usual for architects, engineers, uh, all these kind of people, students sometimes, if they want like a final mockup, like super well finished. And this is a, a very nice project we did it a long, long, long time ago, just was just after finishing the, the master course with some colleagues also from the master course. Uh, we want a competition. It was kind of funny because we entered into a competition for sculptures. <clears throat> uh, we sent a mock-up of the model on the left. The model on the left is a model on Rhino. The, and the idea, the idea of this was like the, to represent the branching system of the interior of uh, an orange. Uh, because this sculpture is basically uh, close to Valencia. It's famous for the oranges and many other things. And, and we won the competition. They told us, you won the competition, now you have to do it. And we said, oh my God, we have to do this. How do we do this? How, whoa, whoa, whoa. How big we said this was? Three meter? Why did we say three meter and not two meter? Oh my God. So we had to do it in three meters, uh, precasted white concrete. It was very interesting because we had the <clears throat> opportunity, it was our first opportunity to put into practice the digital fabrication tools, the milling machine to make the mold and, and do the casting of all this, all, of all this piece, that it was just one single piece. No? These are pictures, uh, screen, it's a screenshot from the web page of ContourMAT with some projects that we have. Some of them are collaborations with other artists. I'm very proud of this one that is a collaboration with Arturo Tedeschi and Biese. Biese is like the biggest company of uh, five axis mill machines. It is in Italy also. And I say also because Arturo Tedeschi is Italian, uh, not me, I'm in Spain, in Madrid. And, um, and it was super interesting because it was a collaboration with this machinery that is five axis, it's not easy to find, it's very expensive. And so the five axis tools can do other type of jobs that cannot do, for example, a three axis one. So there you could share, if you want, uh, Pavlin, a link to Arturo Tedeschi and another link to PSA company, uh -huh. where you can find a lot of information about this digital fabrication techniques, about images of meshes, the one on the left, bottom left is a, a mesh from Arturo that we ma managed to manufacture and so on. Many projects for different, I'm very proud of this one because one was one of the first ones. It was a, a, a client, a private client that trusts us and said, yeah, I want a wine rack like an amoeba or something like that. And we, we managed to do something. And the good thing of parametric design is that you can apply the same logics or the same algorithms to different scales. For example, we had some, we have developed some algorithms to show some Arabic patterns 
we are based on Alhambra's uh, patterns here in, in the south of Spain, no? Granada. And, uh, and these patterns, we apply them to two different projects. One project that was for a client on the bottom, that was just uh, some small pieces of wood to cover some furniture from Ikea. And the other one on the top, it was the same algorithm for an urbanistic scale for a competition in Doha, and we won the competition. So sometimes the same algorithm uh, is useful for uh, different scales. That's kind of the power of uh, parametric design or algorithmic design. We do a lot of uh, bookshelves for different clients. They see the ones that we have done and they ask us if we can develop some others. And they start to do with the hands something like this in the space. I want it to go here, to go here, to see. And you say, every time that you do this, it's 500 euros. So stop doing this, please. <laughs> no, because they, they, they become artists also. Uh, other clients, uh, prefer to do something bigger. So we have developed also some rooftops, for example, here in Madrid. This I love these projects because uh, it, it is not, it's not like a piece of furniture, it's a system. You just develop the system no, with the slices, with sections in both directions. And then you start removing, extracting, like Boolean differencing uh, parts of it, depending on what the client needs. It's like, I want here a barbecue. Okay. Don't worry, what is the size of the barbecue? Boom, I will make the hole for the barbecue. I want here uh, uh, bamboos, like in this one. I want all this one. Okay, I will make the hole for the bamboos. I want a sofa where I can see the stars at night. Okay, so, so it's like a, a more a system than a final sculpture or something like that. We have worked for interesting companies. For example, this is IKEA, but IKEA, Maybe you don't know if you know IKEA. IKEA is like a big place where you enter and buy your stuff. But IKEA also it's IKEA group that is bigger than just IKEA that we know that be, uh, that uh, let's say it's owner of the whole mall. It's not only where IKEA is, but it's where IKEA, Le, Le Roi Marlin, uh, Fnac, and many others are there. No, so IKEA is the owner of everything. It's not just the IKEA shop that you go and this was for the ikea group because they needed furniture that uh, could last more time than just the ikea normal standard furniture and we made like, like these pieces that were super thick in wood because here i know i think there was every day there were like twenty thousand people going through these pieces of furniture so they had to be like very strong And finally, this is one of the most interesting projects we did. This is a long time ago already. It's um, the refurbishment of a um, Japanese restaurant. And I like it because of its simplicity. For example, the piece on the right of the picture, it's just a loft. If you were familiar with Rhino tools, loft is just a tool that connects curves and that's it. Well, it's something that you can do in two minutes in Rhino or in Grasshopper. But then to develop it with milling machine, it takes a lot of time because you have to mill it, you have to assemble it, sand it, finish it, varnish, sand again, varnish again, etc. So, and we do the whole process because uh, we try to do this uh, with um, in collaboration with some carpenters and so on, and it didn't, it never worked. It never worked out because uh, they don't understand how the pieces go, they don't understand that all the pieces could be different and they get stressed. So we have to do the whole process or at least we have to be there. No, you can hire some people, but you have to, to be there in the sanding and varnishing. Otherwise it is very difficult to make this work. These are some pictures of the, rest of the restaurant. And I think I had yeah, a small video here. Let's move it forward. It's based. I, I found this picture and I said, yeah, this is what we're looking for. When you go to eat sushi, uh, you can see in the salmon pieces, no, the skeletal musculature, no, those lines with white lines and so on. And I, I thought it was perfect for the, for the inspiration for this restaurant because when you meal, when you 3D meal the plywood, 
in this case, it was pine tree plywood. You can see the lines of the different layers of the plywood with the different veneer directions and so on. And somehow it resembles the, 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 the pieces of the salmon no? because you're doing the same, you're cutting the salmon in diagonal. So this is the milling machine we have cutting some of the pieces and milling the edges, as you can see, with some references. Those references help you to uh, connect uh, pieces with each other. You have to glue, etc. press. And then once you have everything, you go there, assemble the big pieces, sand it. And it was the final result. After this project, we have developed uh, several projects um, with the same technique because there are many clients that go there, like the project, and then they look for you. No, it's like who did this? I want something like this or something similar or something based on this. So we have developed like uh, some other projects thanks to this project. So sometimes there are projects that are uh, very interesting to do because they are gonna they're gonna be seen and experienced by by many possible customers also, no? many customer, many possible clients. <laughs> okay. So that was control map part. Okay, what I usually do with uh, my company. And then uh, to understand what we're going to do about the G code, because with control map, I got a lot of experience basically on milling machine. Milling machine, as you saw in the video, is this machine that mills, that removes material, no? To, to move this machine, you have to do it with a code called G code, G code, okay? But we develop, I mean, we don't develop our own G code. We use different software for, for that. But then at the university where I teach a master course, uh, they asked me to uh, go to uh, the Bartlett School of Architecture with our students to do a collaboration. And there they had um, several robot arms and one of them was equipped with a very nice system for clay extrusion. Okay? And what we have to do with the students was to experiment with this material. And this was interesting because this was a few years ago and there I, I had to learn the code for the robot. The code for the robot is interesting because it's different for each robot brand. So if you use, for example, Kuka, that is a German brand, uh, you have to use KRL, that is its own language. If you use uh, FANUC, it's another language. If you use ABB, uh, it is uh, Rapid, that is another language. So it's like its own brand has its own language, its own code system, let's say. And it, it's kind of hard, it's quite hard. So, But once you understand that, you understand a lot about the logics and about how to move an object, in this case, a robot arm, no? how to provide the tools. So these were different projects as the students were developing. Uh, very interesting ones because for example, this is a very pervert way to use clay in the sense that clay works under compression, no? like a stone, like concrete. And we were working here under tension. You know, we're living, doing these funiculars. And we found it super interesting because we took pictures of that with shadows and so on. And it was useful for the project that the student was developing because the students have to develop one single project. And here we were experimenting with shapes and so on. For example, this other student, Paula, uh, had uh, a project in Canary Islands. In Canary Islands is very famous, the um, carnival. Okay? And so she wanted to develop a project that would change the facade according to the carnival. So as the carnival comes, it's like, if the building gets into a costume, no? and then when the carnival finishes, it's again the normal building back. No? So she had no project. It was at the very beginning of the expiration, and we worked with a cylinder, and we moved the path outside of the cylinder for the robot, so she could create like this kind of 
arms and uh, and these arms were useful to for example show that they could break that if you water them they break again and the facade could change no somehow so there on the left you see the drawing that we have to develop and on the right you can see part of those um, tips that go outside no those triangles that go outside okay Obviously, not many people have a robot arm with a strudel of clay. But this is interesting. Tons of people have a desktop FDM 3D printer. No, it's probably some of you uh, have a, a 3D printer in your home, like the typical, I don't know, an Ender or a or Creality. No, it's the same, or a Prusa or many others. And what we can do is instead of using normal software to develop our 3D printed objects, what we could do is to create our own G-code the same as with a robot arm or the same as a milling machine does. So one of my personal models in life, I have several others, but one of uh, my favorite ones is you can do almost anything with Grasshopper. I like it a lot because it's like, tell me what do you want to do? I will do it with Grasshopper and people, <laughs> sometimes uh, make fun of it and it's like come on Diego do this in grasshopper I don't, whatever no what's the dishes and it's like come on you're not gonna watch the dishes with grasshopper but I have a video at YouTube of how to win the lottery with grasshopper for example no it's like can you win the lottery with grasshopper no obviously not I didn't win the lottery otherwise probably I, I, I would not be here <laughs> I don't know <laughs> but or yes who knows um, but uh, it is interesting, for example, to work with uh, probability and with numbers, with parameters, and you can do many things in Grasshopper. No? So that is a video on YouTube. If you type like how to win the lottery with Grasshopper, I think it's going to appear. If, you, if you're a Grasshopper user, you will find it useful because uh, there I explain how to work with some tools from Latchbox, that is a plugin, an app for Grasshopper, <clears throat> to read Excel files. For example, that is kind of useful to work with data from an Excel file. And so as you can do almost everything with Grasshopper, I said, let's 3D print directly with Grasshopper. Because if you want to 3D print with Grasshopper at the time that I was worried about this, there was a plugin, a very nice one by Arthur Mamumani. It's an awesome and incredible uh, Grasshopper user and tutor, but, it was for me it was super difficult to handle this silk worm app um, and also it happened the same that with every single software for slicing for 3d printing that in the end <clears throat> you could only do a couple of things i mean you can just provide your stuff and then pff, that happens but you know what is going on so i was talking with my friend gianluca pugliese that one there hi gianluca uh, he is uh, the WASP um, representative for uh, the 3D printers. WASP is a 3D printing uh, company uh, for Spain and Portugal. And he has the three meter 3D printers at the office and he has robot arms and so on. So he's a, a super expert in, in 3D printing, much more than me. He has also this company, Low Poly, Low Poly Design Studio, where he can provide services of 3d printing this is an interesting link also to low poly in instagram also they have a web page but i think instagram is uh, is faster uh and they're experimenting they're very worried about sustainability and this is super interesting for 3d printing because usually we use pla abs and the standards nylon etc but he is reducing the amount of plastic mixing the plastic with other materials spare materials like coffee coffee that you have already used, I mean, or orange pills or uh, uh, car tires or this kind of stuff. So he's able to reduce like 60, 70 percent. Also cork, I remember. Uh, in, uh, and that, that you can 3D print objects using those materials. Uh, so what it, it, it makes like a little bit more sustainable this technology, no? And so talking with him, he said, you are an expert on 3D printing. I'm an expert on Grasshopper. Let's put everything together and let's explain in a very simple book, like a manual, like a tutorial, how to 3D print directly in Grasshopper. And so we did this book. I have to say that we, we were able to do this book basically because it was the COVID. 
if it would not have been the COVID, I would have never found the time to do this because doing a book takes a lot of time, believe me. It's like, maybe you have the material, but then you have to arrange everything, put it nice. Now I don't like it that much. I think that that always happens. That you do something and then when you review it, you don't like it that much. Uh, but anyway, it's still very useful. It is called Advanced 3D Printing, but I have to say that I regret that, that name because in the end, it shows like the most simple way to 3D print. It's not an advanced way of 3D printing. It is advanced because it's something that we don't know. It's when we use any software for 3D printing, we understand what's going on. So the, and this book explains the logics of that, of that. But I have to say that in the end, it's, it should be called or named something as the most basic 3D print that you can do align and something like that. Anyway, it's fine, advanced 3D printing. It is available at uh, Amazon. Yeah, that's something that I was explaining this straight to Bavlin. It's interesting because if you, for example, think on doing a book, why not? Uh, you need um, an editorial, a company you know, that believes in you, in your book, in the contents, in the clients that are going to buy that book in order to invest a lot of money to print out, for example, 1,000 or 2,000 books you know, at once. And then let's see if you can sell all that amount of books hopefully you could sell uh, millions but it's not that easy so there is a in amazon there is an option that you upload just the pdf the of the interior of the book the content and the a pdf with the cover is the cover that you see there that cover on the left is the pdf that we uploaded and then amazon prints it out only if they sell one single book so if you just sell one book that is your mother who buys the book. Uh, they will print it out and deliver it. And that's it. No more. Not 1,000. So we expected that not many people would buy this book. Uh, in the end, it happened that it has been kind of a success. I mean, we've, we've sold more than 3,000 right now. That I mean, we're talking about Grasshopper, but it's kind of not that popular. And we're talking about 3D printing with Grasshopper basically for clay. So it's like something super weird. And it, uh, I'm very happy that that uh, in the end, uh, it was useful for, for many people. No? So after all these things that I have explained to you, let's put this into practice and let's create some G code with Grasshopper. So if you have a computer with yourself, obviously you have it, unless you're watching this from, the, from your smartphone, let's Open Rhino and let's open Grasshopper. You can use Rhino 6 or Rhino 7. It does not matter. Or you could use also Rhino 5, I guess, if you install Grasshopper. The problem is that with Rhino 5, you have to install Grasshopper as an exterior external app. It is not integrated. But uh, yep, you can use any Rhino and Grasshopper because the tools we're going to use are native tools from Grasshopper and kind of uh, basic ones. Okay. At this moment, uh, Vablin, maybe we can make a small, uh, not break, but a stop and see if there is any doubt, any question before uh, we- I think we, we're good on YouTube. Uh, I don't see anything, uh, any prompts on uh, YouTube, but uh, Zoom, of course, I would just uh, say if uh, anyone has question, please use raise hand or you can just switch on your videos unmute yourself and ask questions at any point but uh, looks like we're good we're good to yeah. go they're good to go or they're sleeping who knows <laughs> that's okay <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. good okay so <clears throat> as my motto is uh, let's use grasshopper for almost everything i'm gonna uh, do the rest of the conference with grasshopper because we could also prepare a presentation in Grasshopper. You see, it's very nice. You can zoom out, see the whole presentation, and then zoom in and start from scratch. So let's talk a little bit first about 3D printers and this type of technology. Maybe you're familiar with them, maybe not that much. So I'm going to do a, like a small introduction to understand where we are and what we're going to do. That is not something that could be used for everything. Okay, well, what I'm going to explain is something very special for just a type of printers. So basically there are two types of uh, technologies for 3D printing, extrusion and sintering. Okay? Uh, the extrusion, it's also called FDM or FFF. FDM stands for Fuse Deposition Modeling. 
this is like in general, like you can depose any kind of material. And it is also called FFF, fused filament fabrication. If the material that you're using is made of, uh, it is shaped into a filament, basically it's plastics, okay? So you could see both of them. So let's say that FDM is a little bit more general and the most general one is extrusion technology. In the extrusion one, there is a material that comes to a nozzle and outputs the same material, but usually a smaller. So this could be a filament of plastic. This could be concrete, chocolate, clay. This could be anything that you put in here. And then it outputs through a nozzle, the same material, but with a smaller diameter. Basically, that's it. You need a build plate. That could be the build plate of the 3D printer, could be the floor, could be anything. And if we're talking about uh, plastics in general, Mm, we need to um, warm up that uh, build plate to around 60, 70 degrees. If it, depending on the material, sometimes you will have to frozen this. If, for example, you're printing chocolate, instead of working at 70 degrees, that it will melt down, you need to freeze the build plate. So it depends on the material. It's like it's uh, the most common one, that depends. And then the, we have another technology that is the sintering or binding technology for 3D printing. <clears throat> In this case, the build plate is the material itself. We don't add a material. The material is already there and could be a pounder like here. And that pounder is like a plaster. And so we have to add another material, a second material or a second technique that sintrize or hardens or binds the material that we have here on the, on the build plate. Okay. So for example, the most common technologies are these ones. SLS, selective laser sintering. We use pounder, like plaster. The main brand is set corp. And the binding technique or material in this case is water. So when we add the water on this pounder, it hardens. I don't know if you have made plaster by hand. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and you use water no, to mix it, and then it hardens. This is the same. Uh, SLS, SLM is the selective laser melting. It's a, it, it is the same technique, but with metal pounder. So the metal pounder is on the bottom. And the binder obviously cannot be water, like with pounder, because the metal with water makes nothing. No? It cannot, it, it does not harden. So in this case, we need a laser. The laser uh, makes the metal uh, melt. And, and, and the metal in reality is not pounder, it's like microspheres. And when they melt, you can bind it and get a metallic piece out of it. No? The main brand is Stratasys. SLA, stereolithography apparatus, is the one of resin. Maybe you're familiar with this one, or maybe you have one because they are kind of cheap. You can buy a resin printer for about $200, 200 euro no? also. So, it is kind of a, an affordable technology. The old ones work with UV light. The, so the material is hardened with a UV, UV light on the surface. And the new ones are DLS, digital light synthesis. That is the same resin, but instead of a light, it's an LCD screen. And so it's faster. It is to work with a screen is faster, boom, because you light enlighten the area that you need to harden, and that's it. And with the light, it takes more time. So this technology, it's a little more difficult to work with. And I'm not gonna, I mean, and the book is not uh, focused on this type of technology because we need to code more stuff. But this other is very simple because. You only need to move the material to the different coordinates. And as the material is going outside, you easily build almost anything. Okay. The most common materials for this technology are plastics, as for example, ABS, PLA, nylon, or PTG. And they can be provided in two formats, filament or pellet. Pellet is like the filament, but small pieces okay, that they melt directly into the extruder and they go out, outside. And there are other no so common materials as clay. It does not need any temperature, just in case you're wondering, no? because usually for plastics, we work 
something in between 190 to 350 degrees, depending if they are normal plastics or more technical plastics. And for clay, uh, the good thing is that you don't need any temperature. Uh, directly as it, as it outputs is fine. They, or you could output, for example, concrete, also no temperature, chocolate. Probably you have to warm up the chocolate and froze and freeze the, the build plate. Or there are other weird things I have seen in the internet. For example, how to 3D print pizza. Okay. Every time that I talk about how to 3D print a pizza, an Italian dies. It's like that. I'm sorry. But uh, there is a super cool video on YouTube. If you type something like uh, 3D printed pizza, you will see how there is a machine with three extruders. One extruder for the base, another extruder for the tomato, another extruder for the mozzarella. And in combination of those, uh, the pizzas are three printed and baked. Anyway, I, I, probably they will be good. Who knows? And so these machines, let's remember the extrusion system was in machine, the FTM, usually uh, are have uh, two types of coordinate systems. Okay? They could be delta, polar systems or Cartesian systems, like the one on the right. I have, th these two uh, are two examples, basically because I have them here at the practice at the office. So I use this for the students when they come and I explain them the G code in Cura in Grasshopper and everything. And we work basically with these two machines, even though I have any others. But um, we don't need to care about the type of uh, coordinate system. In the Delta ones, if this is the base where three print, the base is a circle and the center is in the middle. So this is the zero, zero, zero. And then if you have, if you want to go here, you have to measure the coordinate from this zero, zero. In the Cartesian ones, depends, depends. The Cartesian ones have a base that could be quadrangular or rectangular. And sometimes the center is in the same place. The zero is, I mean, the zero is in the center or sometimes the zero is in a corner. So you have to know what is the zero of your machine before you start working, okay? This is very important because if the zero, zero, zero is here, your modeling Rhino, and now we're talking already about Rhino and Gasover. If this is zero, this is X, Y, and Z, your model will have to be in here in this area. So if you have a cylinder like this, you have to be modeled here because your zero, it is in here. And so the cylinder will be here. If you're working with a polar machine like this one, usually the center is, uh, the zero is in the center. So your model will have to be here if you want it in the center of the machine. Hmm? So the first thing that we need to know before doing our G code is to know which machine are we working with and where it, where it has the center. About polar system and Cartesian system, we don't need to care because it is the firmware. The firmware is the software that it is inside of the machine, or that it is here or that it is here. That is a software that is installed in the electronics that will deal with the information that we will provide. So what we're going to provide our coordinates of the cylinder that we want to three print, no, point. And those points will be transformed into a text, into a G-code. That G-code goes into the machine here or here. And then the firmware, that is that software that is in the machine, will translate that text into movements for the machine. It does not care if the machine is polar and, and it has to go up and down to move, or if it has to go in X, Y, and Z. Okay? We don't need to care about it. Okay, so let's remember, if you know it, or let's learn it, if you don't know it, what is the standard 3D printing workflow? You know, when you want to 3D print an object, probably this is, you're familiar with this. So for example, if you're working in Grasshopper and you have a no, some model in grasshopper. Imagine that you made something with holes, with Weber bird and kangaroo and blah, blah, blah. In the end, in your into grasshopper, you have to bake it into Rhino. The magic finishes in here, no? Because you do everything as well, bake it into Rhino, perfect. And from Rhino, could happen that you have a mesh 
because you had a mess in Grasshopper. And then we will create directly the STL file. Okay. Or it could happen that you had a BREP. A BREP is a surface or a poly surface. Okay. In that case, you have to transform it first into a mesh and from mesh into an STL. If you're familiar with Rando, you say, no, no, Diego, I work with surfaces and I go directly to STL. Yes. But then the S when you are in the STL options, there is a menu, a dialog box that asks you, what is the tolerance? Maybe you're familiar with this. What is the tolerance for your machine, for your surface? The tolerance means what is gonna be the maximum distance between the surface that you have, no, the surface that you have, and the mesh that the uh, software has to create for the STL file, because the STL only allows you to have meshes. And this is super interesting. Not many people know this, but surfaces and polysurfaces do not exist. When you go into Rhino and you do a cylinder with a radius, you say, no, this, this, is, this is my cylinder from top view. Radius five. Five what? Five whatever, five millimeter, because we're gonna 3D print. And for 3D printing, we have to work in millimeters. Okay. So when you have a cylinder of five, all the points of that cylinder have to be at five millimeters from zero. That means that if you zoom in on your cylinder, every infinite point that you can find in here, every point, every point, every point, infinite points have to be at five units from zero. That's impossible. There is no software that can handle an infinite object, okay? So what uh, we work with is this type of surfaces that are perfect because they are representations of mathematical concepts. But in the end, what we see is a mesh. A mesh is a more simplified object, okay? It's an object with a discrete number of points on it and edges and faces means that it cannot be infinite. If I have a point here, I will have an upper, another point in here. And from point to point, I will have a straight line. So in meshes, a cylinder, imagine that this is a cylinder made with meshes. I'm exaggerating it, okay? These vertices will be at five from the center, but these other points, no, these are closer to five. No, there will be 5.9, whatever. But this is the reality. This is a real world. No machine or software can deal in reality with surfaces or polysurfaces. So in order to 3D print it, when we export it as an STL file, STL comes from a stereolithography. A stereolithography comes from 3D printing. Okay. So every time that we're going to use a 3D printer with an STL file, we have to change from surfaces and polysurfaces to meshes because the real world can only handle meshes that they have a discrete a certain discrete means a certain uh, affinite number of elements okay. <clears throat> and so you have ah, i was talking about that tolerance so that tolerance when you go that directly here into here, that tolerance that says, for example, 0 0.01, that's the maximum distance between your surface and the mesh that it has to create to do the STL file. 0 0.01 is a good number, no? I mean, 0 0.01 millimeter distance from the edge of the cylinder to the edge of the mesh. It's like good, but sometimes it is not enough and sometimes it's too much. That's something you, you have to handle, okay? As we're talking about 3D printing, there are some basic concepts that we have to, 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 to care about in, for our model. For example, it is important that the model is closed, closed like this one, like this box, because that way the software can find an interior and an exterior. And so 3D print the interior, this area. There's like a boundary. There is a boundary close that is the box and the machine is gonna concentrate in here and not in the outside, in the outskirts of it, let's say, no? So it has to be closed. <clears throat> Important way, my pencil. It has to be no non-manifold. This is a difficult concept. Non-manifold means non-manufacturable is the same, no? Change manifold by manufacture. 
And when you have something that cannot be manufactured, it's not manufacturable. So it has to be the opposite. It can be manufactured. Okay. This means it can be manufactured. What does it mean? It means that it shouldn't contain weird errors on the topology of the object. Imagine that in this box, we have another surface in here, an interior surface doing something like that, no? Connected to these edges. In this case, we have two interiors, interior one and interior two. This is very, this is a, a, a very big problem for the printer because it's like, okay, when I'm going to 3D print this, what do I do with the surface on the middle? Is it exterior or is it interior? It is exterior for one, but then interior for two, or is it exterior for both? It, is, it's, it creates like a kind of a complex um, situation for the machine, because usually when we have a, a box, a normal box, what we have to define is, okay, I want to have the exterior as exterior and the interior as interior. And the interior, I want a refill. No, I want to refill it with a percentage, 10 percent. But here, it's like you refill this with 10 and this with 10, but then you have something in between. It's a, it's a problem, okay? Rhino does not allow you to connect edges like this one, like this one, to more than two surfaces, this and this. So the third one, this other surface is impossible to do in Rhino. But when you import, export stuff, or some, with some automatic operations for meshes, could happen that there are like, for example, whoop, another surface here joined to this one. So I have one, two, and three on the same edge. That is an error, okay? So we have to try to avoid this type of objects that gives these errors because they are not interesting for the 3D printing. <clears throat> also, if we can have a good base, it is much better. A good base means uh, in contact with the build plate. No, this is my build plate. This has a lot of base, so this is super good. This is better to 3D print this than, for example, 3D print a pyramid like that. If we have to 3D print a pyramid like that, I will rotate it, no, and I will have it like this. This means that it has a good base. Okay, so that's like a, something basic. And if we're talking about um, digital fabrication, CNC technology, we have to work with the minimum um, in the minimal um, units that are uh, millimeters for the metric system and inches for the imperial system. That's important. This is important, okay? Because if you work, for example, in centimeter, imagine that this box measures 10 centimeter. It is closed, it is no known manifold, and it has a good base. And you export it as a steel. It's like, ooh, I have a B rep, ooh, and go to a steel and export it as an steel. Those 10 centimeters become 10 units, just 10. When someone imports it in the, in the software for 3D printing, if you send it, for example, to a company for 3D printing, when they open it, it will be 10 units, and this will become 10 millimeters for them. So they will send you an object like this. It's like, ah, we 3D printed your model. It is super cheap. Uh, it's only 10 euro. I said, wow, awesome, 10 euro. And then when they give it to you, it's a, a box 10 times smaller no? than what you expected, for example, because 10 unit, 10 centimeter become 10 millimeter. So careful with the units in general. Good, so you have your file. Perfect, you are still. Then what you have to go is to a slicer software, that is what we do in general, that creates the G code. The G code is the file that we have to provide the machine that goes to the firmware for the machine to move. This software usually it could be different types. Uh, the most common ones, for example, are Slicer, Simplify 3D, Cura, Repetier, and many others. Okay, so if you buy, for example, a machine of a certain brand, they will provide uh, the software of the machine. Okay, for example, I have another machine that is B, B, B the first it is called. So they have a software that is B software. So, but these ones are like the most common ones. And in this software, this type of software that is called in general a slicer. Slicer is like because it makes a slices. 
of the model, you have to set some stuff as the layer height. No, that is the, what we call the also the resolution of the object. It's usually something from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 or something like that. Depends. For example, if you are if you're printing jewels, it will be 0 0.001, maybe the layer. If you're printing like Nagami chairs, then you're talking about maybe two millimeters no? layer height or three, whatever. So depends. But you have to set this file that is equivalent to the resolution of the object. If there is an infill or something on the interior of it, you have to decide, tell how much is the infill in a percentage, usually. The build plate contact type, see if you want to print something extra to have like a better contact with the build plate. If you want supports, depending on the geometry, you know, if you have to 3 print something like this, you will need support in here, <coughs> the temperatures, depending on the material, etc. There are many parameters. Once you have all those parameters, you say, okay, get the file. And it creates something called G code. That G code that could be like, it looks like super weird. It is easy to understand because it has three parts. It has a start protocol that tells to the machine to get ready. It's like, hey, we're gonna do something, okay? So get ready, what do you need? I need you to work with uh, absolute coordinate or relative coordinate. That means uh, for destruction, uh, we're gonna add numbers or we're gonna always give the, say, the, the number for destruction from one point to another point. Or I want you to go all the access to home, means that it goes to the beginning. It's just if you're familiar with the printing process, no, the first thing that you that the machine does is like goes to the beginning. Okay, home, all access. Uh, to override this to but okay, whatever. It has to do a lot of the stuff to get ready. Okay. This G code it has a format like this. Oops, sorry, like a letter and a number. Okay. So a G code is a code that is called alphanumeric because it contains letters and numbers. The letter means something and the number also means something. The letters, for example, N are related with the machine and the letters of G are related with the code. Okay, It is called G code basically because uh, all the stuff at a G code are Gs. G is the letter that we use to tell the machine to move. Okay. Without the Gs, nothing happens. So that's why it is a G code, because the G is the letter that someone decided that was going to be the letter to move. No? So G is like move. Move what? If it is G28, move all access to home. So we type G28, and the, if you remember here, the machine in the firmware understands that G28 is go home. Okay, easy. Then. Uh, there is a core on this G code with the instructions. The instructions to print our design. And those will be different from one design to another design. No? If you're printing a box, it's different than a cylinder. So that core will be different depending on the geometry we're doing. The structure of this core is always the same. It's something like this. G1, that means move, because we want to 3 print, at this speed, or feed rate, that's the F in millimeter minute, to this coordinate in X, this coordinate in Y, if there is a coordinate in Z also, and extrude all this material. So it's like, okay, it's not that difficult, no? Because we're saying the machine move at this speed. Okay, I can change the speed to this coordinate, to the next coordinate, boop, 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 boop. So if you have a polyline, it's like following that polyline from coordinate to coordinate. And I also I want to extrude material. So I have to add a number to extrude some millimeters of material. That's what that five means, five millimeters of material. Okay? If we don't add this information, the machine will only move at this speed from one place to another. Once we add the extrusion, it will also extrude material. And once we have finished with our model, the machine has to go back to, well, to, to move the build plate down or up, whatever, depending on how it works. And that is the end protocol. 
could be just a G28 home all access, or it could be a lot of stuff like uh, do beep when you finish, uh, lights on, blah, 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 turn off, uh, cool down, many things. Okay? The end protocol. So this is what the slicer software does, this G code. But we can do it ourselves with Grasshopper. So back to our model in Grasshopper, we don't need to bake it into Rhino. We're going to directly jump into the G code all in Grasshopper. For that, we're going to use the most amazing and simple tool ever that is Concatenate. Concatenate, it's a tool that is in the set menu text. This is interesting. I don't know if you, if you work with uh, Grasshopper, uh, there is an option with Control Alt that uh, an eye of info appears. If you click on it, it tells you where the tool is in the menu. No, it is in the set menu text. Okay. Anyway, so this is basically the tool that we're going to use. The rest of the tools is like pff, the design, the geometry, the curves, and so on. But this is, this one creates the G code. So in our grasshopper, we could have a bit rip, no? surface or poly surfaces. We could have a mesh, or we could have curves. We could have polylines, we could have points. We could have anything of this that we will transform all those into just X, Y, Z coordinates. We will put them in here and output something called G-code that the machine is going to understand. If we start with a B-rep, let me start again from scratch. If we start with a B-rep, we'll have to transform that B-rep into maybe curves and the curves into polylines, because with the curves, we have the same problem than with the surfaces, with the V-reps, that they are infinite. So we have to simplify them into polylines with some vertices. And those polylines into points, and those points into X, Y, Z coordinates. So we have to follow more or less this path. If we have a mesh, as the mesh is made of planes, you know, faces, we say, uh, when uh, we will skip the curves, we won't, we cannot create curves from the mesh. We will create directly polylines, and from polylines points, and from points x y z coordinates. And once we are in y z x y z coordinates, we are super close to create our G coding grasshopper. Uh, problems. <clears throat> it was not going to be that good. Well, the layer height uh, because we don't have a, a software now in between that gives us parameters, so we have to deal you no know, with all this stuff. In grasshopper manually, according to, according to the design. So the layer height will depend on the sections that we will do of our model. So if we're doing that box, remember the box that we had before, no? and we want to three print that box, we have to section the box. So the distance between the sections, this distance will be the layer height. This distance will be that layer height. If we want infill, for some reason, I want I know, the machine to do something like that all the time and have an infill, blah, 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 inside, I have to design it. I have to design it means I have to do the path. I have to do the curse that, this, that create the infill. That is a problem. But that is super interesting. Because, for example, if you're doing a pavilion, no? something like this, where here is bigger, here is thinner, and here is uh, medium, maybe the infill has to be adapted to the forces inside of this pavilion. No? And so maybe you don't need uh, like a very big infill here, something like that, but you need a lot of infill in this part, like a super complex infill that does, I don't know what, here is not necessary, but then for some reason you need more infill here because there are a lot of strength and maybe you need also infill here because there are a lot of strengths no, of the pavilion pushing outside and pushing outside. So this infill, it's impossible to create in any software, in any slicer software like Cura or any other, because those others usually create the uh, uh, something based on a grid, even that is not a grid, it could be a geroid or something more complex, but this custom infill cannot be created. So if you're doing this project, you have to design the infill but that is amazing because then the infield can be anything. Mm -hmm. uh, the build plate contact, if you want extra lines here 3D printed to have your object like more stable, has to be also designed. You have to design the lines. If you want travels, travels means movements of the machine in the air, no? 
from one point to another point. Imagine that you're doing something like this. Your model is something like this. Okay. When you're printing here, you have to move or jump from here to here and then print this part. That travel has to be also designed. You have to tell the machine to travel from one place to another without extrusion. So that takes a lot of time. That, that makes your life more difficult in here. Supports, you have to design them, but my advice is try to design without supports because supports uh, waste a lot of material. If you could design for 3D printing, it's better to design without supports because you lose a lot of material and time. So for example, uh, companies as Nagami, they never use supports. So they design that they don't need supports. And the temperatures, if you use plastics, uh, they can be copied from the or uh, from an original G code. Okay. So once we have everything designed, we can create our own G code in Grasshopper as an output of this tool concatenate. Let's do it. Okay. If you have your Grasshopper open, we can do this in 20 minutes, half an hour, and then leave some time for some questions. So let's start with a cylinder. So uh, yeah, let's start with, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm checking the chat. Ah, okay. Thank you, Bablin, you're, you're sharing some links. Uh, I, I have a question, Bablin, are, are, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. Is, is, is this recorded so they could uh, watch it after? Yeah, yes. it's, on, right. uh, it's on YouTube as well as, of course, we're recording it on Zoom, but everything will be on YouTube. They can pause it, slow down and watch everything. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. So if someone gets lost, uh, there is no problem because they could review it if, uh, if they want to, to do it again. To, Absolutely. To get some Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with a cylinder. I'm gonna do it here in parallel. Okay, I have the example already done, but I'm gonna do it again. So I'm gonna hide all my stuff, preview off, and start from scratch. So if you have open Rhino in Grasshopper, you won't see anything. You know, you see this curves because I have them in here, but let's hide them. Okay, this is what you see. Okay, <clears throat> let's imagine that uh, we're gonna use the clay CD printer, but it could be a plastic one. Okay, and we're gonna print a cylinder in Grasshopper. We're gonna create the G-code in Grasshopper. I'm gonna use the zero, zero as the center of my model. No? So this is X, this is Y, and the, this is gonna be the zero, zero. But if you want to move it somewhere, you can easily move it here where it says based with another coordinate. We can do it, but I'm gonna use the zero, zero by default. So I'm gonna start with a cylinder. Cylinder is a tool that it's on the surface menu, but if you don't know the menus, it's, it is difficult to know where the tools are. So you can always double click on the canvas, that is the space of Grasshopper, or you can just space bar okay, and type cylinder. Probably if it is the first time that you use Grasshopper, you won't see it like me. You will see it like this, seal, seal. For me, this is super weird. It's not like cylinder. For me, this is Castilla y Leon. In Spain, this is a region of Spain. Uh, so it's not cylinder. So it is really hard to work with uh, only three letters because we don't know what this what it does. So you have to come to display, draw full names. If you're familiar with Grasshopper, instead of working with full names, what we usually do is to work with icons. There you see the icon of a cylinder, but it is true that Sometimes the icons, uh, we don't know what they do. What I recommend to my students is to download a plugin from Food for Rhino called Bifocals. Bifocals is a very single plugin, very simple plugin, sorry. But it's just one single tool that you drag and drop. And then it creates a label on the tool. So that way you can have both worlds, let's say the world of icons and the world of text because the cylinder it is here so that way you could draw with icons and so on so i'm going to work like this okay because that way you can <clears throat> understand 
what's going on here and because it's the name cylinder and you can also learn the icons because it is important to learn the icons because the brain associates faster an image the image of the icon to what it does than if you, we have to read the complete word no to know what it does so it is better to get accustomed to icons in general so there we have a small icon you see if you zoom in it is that small because the radius is 0 0.5 millimeter. Ah, by the way, we should be in millimeters. I mean meters in Rhino here, right click. Where, is it? where are the units in the settings? We should change to millimeters. I told you, we have to be in millimeters or inches. And now I'm in meters. Oh, millimeters. Okay, millimeters, nothing. No, don't scale anything. Leave it as it is. So radius is gonna be how much? Uh, 25, 25 and 50 millimeters length. So double click, 25, okay. You can also do it with a panel if you're familiar with Rasshopper. Double dash, 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 50 for the length. You can do it as you wish with a 25 like this, a number slider with a panel, whatever. So, um now that we have our cylinder the cylinder is empty we're not gonna create the base because it takes some time we're gonna work only on the on the surface first thing we have to do is to use contour because contour is gonna section our model i don't know if you're familiar with this tool it will is it very useful to develop as planes every kind of model so contour there are several type of contours this one here I use icons also in the explanations because if you have to find the name contour, as you can see, there are several contours. So you, but you, the one that you have to find out is this one with this icon. Huh? As you saw in Rhino and Grasshopper, there are tools that do that are similar. So we have to find the most appropriate one. So this is the shape I want to contour. Contour. The direction it is already set is zero zero one. The point is set is a zero zero zero. And now the distance for the contours is gonna be the layer height directly. So the number I'm gonna type in here, for example, one, is gonna be the distance for the contours There we have. So my layer height is gonna be one millimeter. Maybe it's a lot, but it is gonna be better for us to display it on the screen, okay? Let me turn off, I have here a nice plugin, a snapping gecko. This is Napping Gecko, Look, you see these reference lines? It is very useful to for those that are crazy about <laughs> the order of the components in Grasshopper, know that they have to be aligned and so on, like me. <laughs> uh, this is very useful because it gets a lot of uh, references from the top, the bottom of the com other components, the wires and so on. But I'm gonna turn it off because it could be too much for the explanation. So uh, once we have the contours, we have curves, 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 curves. We need, I told you, from curves, we need polylines. Oh, we're in the V rep. We have curves. Now we need polylines. We could skip the polylines if we go directly into the points world. That is another option to go into the points and then display the polyline that the, the points create. So we're gonna do it like that. That is basically the same. So from these contours, we're gonna divide those curves into a certain amount of points, 50 or 100 or whatever, okay? And we're gonna use divide curve. There we are. It asks for the curves to divide. The count is gonna be the number of segments. By default is 10. We're gonna add a few more, like 50. The more we add, <clears throat> the better resolution that the object is gonna, is gonna have, okay? But like this is fine to show the example. Well, it is almost done. I mean, we're gonna create a polyline that shows the path that connects this point. So if you go to polyline <clears throat> and connect these points to polyline and hide all the previous stuff, you know how to hide previous components, previous steps, select all, right click outside, preview off.
what we're doing is creating polylines with the lists of points. The points are organized, I don't know how expert are you with Grasshopper, but uh, Grasshopper sometimes tend uh, to organize the information in more than one simple list of data. Uh, it's what uh, Grasshopper names as a data tree. Here you have the tree, the tree menu. This tree menu does not is not related with real trees, with forests and this kind of stuff. Uh, what it means is uh, it's uh, related with data tree. A data tree is when we have more than just one list of that data or data. Okay. What is going on here in these points? is that uh, I have a lot of information, as you can see in that panel. If we add a panel, a panel itself, we can display some stuff like the coordinates. And if you scroll down, you will see that there are like some dark lines and the indexes start to count from zero again. This means that the list of points has been split into smaller lists. So all the points that are, I don't know how many, 20, uh, 2,500 are split into several groups of points. Those groups come from the contours. So its contour, its line, is like if it creates a group of points and so its own list of points, okay? Da, 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 da. And then the next contour creates other division points and those division points are in another group, in another list, and so on. Okay? So in the end, we'll have as many lists as sections or contours we have in here. That's why when I connect this divide curve to polyline, the polylines are not connected in between. I mean, if they start in one point and finish in the last point, in this point. So this is the first and this is the last, and it finishes. And then it starts with another list first and last, and then another and another, et cetera, et cetera, okay? That is a nice way to display this information with the cables, with the wires. If the wires are discontinuous, means that there is more than one list, that this is a data tree. If they are continuous, like this one, means that there is only one list, in this case, with one element. The cable, the wire could be double, means that contains more than one element, but in one single list, okay? So the display of the wires is very important. As <clears throat> we want to uh, display the 3D printing of this point, what I'm going to do is to use a tool called Flatten Tree. Flatten Tree is in that menu of trees here, is this one. It's probably the most common or the most used component in Grasshopper. It is that common that it is included in every single input and output. If you right click on any input, you will see there an option to flatten, as well as, for example, graph, simplify, or other such reverse, reparameterize, etc. cetera. No? So those options are always there. Reverse, flatten, graph, simplify, sometimes unitize, sometimes expression, but those four are always there, and flatten is one of them. Means that if I flatten this group of lists, there is a, another very nice tool, this one, Param Viewer, that summarizes the information in here. The data is in 50 branches, 50 lists, all these 50 lists on the left. It's list 50 elements. If you double click on it, it will make a diagram of the data structure with, the with 50 branches, with the 50 lists. So if you flatten this structure of data, what you get is plop, one single list. The cable, the wire will be double. And the result is that we got rid of all those uh, dark uh, headings. No? So it is one single list with all the points. The points are not modified. The data is not never modified. It's just the data structure. So if after flat and tree, you connect it to polyline, now we will have one single list of points and the polyline will show us what's going to be, what's going to happen in here, what we're going to 3D print. Starting on the first point, going to the last of the first polyline and continuing to the first of the next polyline. So we're gonna 3D print something like this. It means that we are displaying 
the path for the 3D printer directly. And it, the good thing is that it is gonna be one continuous single curve. If you show the output after polyline, it will say one single polyline curve. This is super interesting because the machine is not stopping. Uh, it has not to uh, retract the material and put the material back again. So the quality is gonna be better, okay? We could do this, that we have done this uh, slope, not with just one single point, we could do it with two points, three points, or with all the points, like a continuous spiral. This is what we call the spiralized for a 3D printing, but that is a little more complex. No, we're not gonna do it here. <clears throat> so this polyline shows or displays the final path of these points, okay? The points here, the points here are the same, but in one single list. What we have to do is to separate the coordinates X and Y to tell the machine where it has to move and how much it has to extrude. So for that, well, this polyline, we can leave it apart because it's gonna be just a path. For that, we're basically gonna use deconstruct point and concatenate. That amazing tool I told you. Deconstruct point, one of the most simple tools in Grasshopper. This is super cool because you can deconstruct almost anything in Grasshopper. Uh, deconstruct something means to give the different parts of it separately. I always do an example with my students. I ask them, do you know tortilla de patatas? Have you heard about the Spanish omelet? Is what tortilla de patatas means? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, do, do you like it? <laughs> Diego, you know where I would have heard that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Question Question for you, Bablin. Uh, what are, do you know, do you remember what are the main ingredients of uh, tortilla de patatas? Uh, I, I believe uh, egg and potatoes, right? And yes. uh, some sort of vegetables depend on what, what, what you're kind of liking. And of course, like all, all your basic ingredients. Salt yes. And pepper yes. And yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. You're right. <laughs> are you really going to <laughs> show it to others? Yeah, Maybe they're show... all hungry at, oh, at yeah. this moment. <laughs> yeah, depending on the country they are. Well, but, but, but the good thing of tortilla is that it is good for breakfast, it is good for lunch, and for dinner. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, tortilla patatas. Uh, perfect, Valin. I mean, it's basic. It's uh, onion, egg and, uh, sorry, um, potato, egg, and then usually onion, no? But you can add also pepper or uh, any others. But basically are those three ingredients. So there was a famous chef that made a deconstructed tortilla. This one here. I, ha I, I have not had the pleasure to, to taste it, okay? But the deconstructed, the deconstruction, is a concept very well used in uh, cooking in, in this field. And when they deconstruct a meal, what they show is the different ingredients separately. And this is what the grasshopper does with uh, the construction of everything. No? So if we deconstruct that tortilla, as you can see in that picture, on the top, we'll have the mousse of potato, in the middle, the egg, and in the bottom, the onion. When you put the spoon inside and you mix everything, you get the same exact taste of the tortilla, but uh, the chefs say that uh, it is much more authentic and powerful than when you mix it all in advance and then you cook it. So this is the constructed tortilla gives provides the three ingredients separately. The deconstruct, in this case of the point, provides the three ingredients of a point uh, separately. So if I type any point like three, five, seven, and give it to deconstruct. I'm gonna add a, a panel in here. The X component will be obviously three. The Y five, Y five, haha. <laughs> and the Z seven, right? So we have these three ingredients separately to do whatever we want. We could mix them up again because also, Grasshopper has tools to construct, to construct anything, to construct a point. So if you take the three, the five, and the seven again, 
you will get exactly the uh, same. I'm going to add an, a new panel. So there is no trick. You have three, five, seven. Perfect. Okay, so we can construct and deconstruct. This is for cooking, it's super important. I'm going to leave it somewhere there. So uh, deconstruct again. We're going to deconstruct all our points, not only one single point, but all our points. So the um, Sorry, there we are. The menus on Zoom are hiding my menus on, on Grasshopper. So the X output are gonna be all the X components of our points. The same happens with the Ys and the Zs of all the points that we want to use for 3 print. But the information like this is not a G code yet. So what we're going to use is concatenate to construct the G code as the machine is expecting. Okay. The good thing of concatenate is that concatenates texts, one text after the other. Okay. But and if we need more than two texts, more than two fragments, if you zoom in, you can see uh, these pluses and minuses, you can add like more inputs. This A, B, C, whatever, it's whatever. It's A, B, C, D. Okay. It's, it does not mean anything in particular. So <clears throat> go. Going back to our G code structure, we need a structure like this. We need G1 move at this speed to this X, to this Y, to this Z also, if necessary, and to this E. E, remember that is destruction. Okay? So we're going to construct something like that. The first fragment of our G code is going to be G1. So you have to type G1. That means move, no? G1. So this is the first part. And the output of this is G1. Perfect. There we are. Uh, we have to tell it to move at a certain speed. We can add it. See, if we're not going to modify the speed, we can add it also here. Feed rate 1,800. Maybe that's a little fast for some machines or some materials, but it is OK. So. That is the first part of the G code. The next will be the X component, but X needs a, let, a letter X, the letter. Okay, so we're gonna add the letter. Another panel, dash dash X. It does not matter if it is capital letters or no. And connect it here. Hmm. As you can see, we have no space between the zero and the X that could be uh, that could provide us some errors. So for example, we can go to this one and add a space, just a simple space. There we have the space. X and after X, the list of X coordinates. Oh, let's have a look at this. Nice. Look how concatenate works. It puts together or combines all the information that we have here. So we have this list with this list, with a list with many components. It will combine all this information. It will be G1 at this speed to this coordinate next, move to this speed at this coordinate, move to this speed at this coordinate, etc. So we're on, on, it, on the way. I mean, the next will be Y. So dash dash Y to move to the Y coordinate. My same problem as before that they are together. So we can add, for example, a space just before Y. Oop, there we are. And uh, Y coordinates after it. Let me do this grasshopper a little bigger that way. And fine, not finally, but after this, I'm going to copy the panel with the Y and type the Z. Same issue as before, that if I just type the Z, it's going to be linked with the last number from the Y coordinates. So I'm going to add a space here. Z, Z coordinates. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This looks like interesting. We have already uh, something that tells the machine how to move. I mean, if we provide this G code to the machine, it will move. It will not destroy, but it will move. OK, easy with the set changing depending on the layer, etc. <clears throat> so what we need to add finally is the extrusion, how much to extrude. So we have to add more, a couple of uh, uh, options more in here. We need to add the letter E, 
I, I prefer ca capitals okay. with the space before, but it's not going to be a problem. So that E means extrude something. How much do we extrude? Depends. For example, if we have a design of a rectangle like this, no? it's like a box, like a prism, and I want to move from this point to this point to this other point, I have to make the extrusion uh, different. The amount of extrusion in here will be, I don't know, uh, two, for example, two millimeters of material. And the amount of material here will be double, maybe will be four. So what we usually have to do is to measure the length of the segment and provide that as extrusion. Measure this and provide it as extrusion. Okay, basically that's the rule. But if we have a model like a cylinder where all the segments are basically the same length, we should know how much we want to extrude. And in this case, maybe I could try with one millimeter. Let's say that I'm gonna extrude one millimeter. It's one millimeter, one millimeter, one millimeter, one millimeter from one to another, okay? So this is like a very rough G code, but it's something that maybe could work, okay? The problem is that uh, the machine needs to get ready and needs to finish. So we will have to add some information in here, like the start G, G protocol and the end protocol. So if you have a machine, a 3D printer, and you want to give it a try, <clears throat> careful, don't break it. But basically, you will need a panel with uh, the start protocol. The start protocol, you can find it easily in a file for 3D printing that is already made. For example, if you have already printed something, you go to that file and you can copy all the stuff at the beginning. That will be G28, blah, 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 uh, M, I don't know how much, etc. And you copy it from your machine, from your from a G code that is already made. No? And you will have to copy also the end protocol that will be a set of instructions. And once you have the beginning, the core, and the end, you have to put everything together. I use a merge into one single panel. Okay. So there you will have the start protocol. Obviously, it's not going to be just one tool all the core and at the very end, the end protocol. And once you have this, you have to provide this to the machine. Maybe your machine works with an SD card, no? It's typical. So we have to create a file from here, right click on it, copy data only. Copy data only because we don't, we're not interested on the indexes here. We're not interested on the, of, on the information of the path, the zero that it's here. So, we're just interested on the data. So copy that only. And then you have to open a very complex software that is Notepad. Right? Notepad, if you're in Windows, uh, if you're in Mac, it is called, um, how is it called? Notes, if I remember. Uh, someone in Mac will tell me, I don't remember. And then, Paste it. And from here, file, save, save as. This is Spanish, sorry. It's not saying the save as. Whatever you want to. And instead of txt file, that is the extension for the for this software, for not, uh, Notepad, you're going to say all files. And in all files, you can set the extension file that you need. For example, uh, trial dot g code that's it save it and that g code you can put it into your machine and the machine will work if the start and end protocols are fine that's all we need okay save that's it so this is like a very rough <laughs> sorry introduction to what it could be the process to control the G code for 3D printing, but I think it's a very, very simple example. If you have other more complex objects, obviously, uh, you can use other strategy. I like a lot that is using isocurves. Isocurves, um, I told you, I'm not gonna 
do all the process, but I'm gonna show it to you. For example, if you start with an ellipse and you rebuild it, rebuilding an ellipse means that uh, the ellipse, I mean, an ellipse by default is a degree two curve. No? There are different types of degree two curves, like circles, ellipses, hyperbolas, parabolas. And, and then what you have to do is to transform it into a degree three curve that will be continuous in case you want to distort it. That is what we're going to do. So I, I rebuilt this curve with uh, eight control points and degree three, copied it, turned the points on and moved just the end points on their sides, on the right and on the left, and did a loft. A loft, a loft means that this is a surface with three edges, two, one edge on the top, one edge on the bottom, and it's called the seam. That is the joint of the two edges in there. And once you have a surface like that, instead of doing contours, because the contours will create a small curve in here, a small curve in here, a small curve in here, and then we have to design the troubles from left, right, etc. It's not that it's not that cool, no, from here to here, etc. You can use ISO curves. It means that um, and that surface, let me preview it and hide the Rhino one, there we are. You can extract ISO curves like preview on this ones. <clears throat> so if you're familiar with Rasopper, you know how to do this. You have to provide information. I just reparameterized the surface here. So the information provided is from zero to one and created coordinates of points. These coordinates go into the surface. No? and create isocurves. So the, iso the good thing of the isocurves is that follow the geometry. And so this path is non-planar. This path from front view, where are you? Here, it's, it's a non-planar. Let me turn this off, pretty off. It's non-planar. So this is something that a normal software for slicing cannot do, okay? But once we have the curves, it's the same as before. Create points, those points will be the path for the 3D printer. And so your 3D printer will start moving as a non-planar, something that we cannot uh, do with a normal slider. I have some videos here. <laughs> or some pictures, for example, no? This, this is a non-planar 3D printing. You just have to design the path. In this case, the path was like also doing some widths. Ah, these were some models that we did with uh, with a master course. Then we, we print them in clay, then we apply the glazing. Here are glazed. Then they, they need to be fired again. And this is the final result of after firing. This is super interesting because that way you can combine tradition with technology. No? You combine the high-tech technology of last hopper, the code, blah, 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 with the tradition of clay or these other materials and or the glazing, the firing and all this kind of stuff. No? Because they also the material has a lot to do. For example, these textures that the glazing can do sometimes are super interesting. No? So these are the type of experiments we do here at, uh, at the course. Or for example, I love this one. This was kind of viral, no? 40,000. Uh, views mm, because in the end what you have to do is just to sh to create the path for the printer and the printer will follow that path so you can use clay you can use plastic you can use anything you can see there the um, the grasshopper the path lines curves and those curves into points the points to the printer so it's not just non-planar it's a, an aerial 3d printing no? And well, I think that's all. Thanks a lot for st staying there for two hours listening to me. And thanks to Digital Futures for holding this uh, tutorial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Diego. I think um, uh, there was a lot to learn. There, of course, will be a lot of questions once, uh, once everyone is trying their hands on uh, onto the workflow. Um, maybe while others are thinking about some questions, comments, or maybe they just want to turn on their video and ask them directly. I do have uh, just some comments and a question for you. 
uh, Lamila, if, if that's okay, let me, I'll just jump in here. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. please do yeah. So, uh, Diego, I think what is what is interesting in the workflow and, of course, the explorations that you, you are doing both with the 3D printing and even CNC milling and other kind of digital fabrication tools is that you're, you're constantly looking at um, how do we optimize the workflow uh, for the machine? How can uh, the design be also incorporated in as part of your, uh, your machine tool parts? So I think tool parts become really, really important over here, whether it's a CNC milling or um, it's um, 3D printing. Uh, it is also interesting to see how one could work efficiently with material and time to fabricate, how things can be also, our grasshopper complex workflows can be made so simple and so easy, how we can also start to incorporate um, uh, simple knowledge of how the machine works into our grasshopper tool parts and inform our geometry. So I think these are these are some really interesting ways and forward for everyone to explore. I think you just opened up with 3D printing, but of course, there is so much opportunity for you to try out for all the machines which work on G-code, which is even robotic arm, right? For that matter. Right. And, right. And uh, CNC milling, laser cutting machine as well. Everything yeah. works on Everything. Uh, this kind of layer by layer uh, addition or subtraction. So I I want to ask you a question. What's next now for uh, for you, for your studios and also for Control Mad? Uh, what are the next uh, advanced things that you are planning? What are uh, the What are the questions you want to leave our audience with? So they can uh, move forward with your workflow and explore more things. Um, well, this could be a little disappointing, but I want to to go back. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I, all the things that you said are extremely important, like uh, the control on the toolpath, the efficiency, the simplicity. Uh, but sometimes I feel that uh, I get uh, trapped by the machines a little bit and the grasshopper and the technology. And I want to start uh, doing what uh, in in food they call uh, tech motional. The tech motional is uh, something that where you use the last technology, but without forgetting that you have to create emotions. And and this is very difficult because when you study architecture, for example, this is my background. Uh, you, you you focus on the idea, on the emotion, on what you want to get. But then when you start working with machines and technology, then it's like if you forget about all those things and then you move just into the machine. So I, what I'm trying to do now is going back to the emotion and see how I can put everything together. That's uh, I don't know how yet. I don't know how, because uh, in the end, you, 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 you get astonished by the technology and, and the machine moving. And then you, you spend hours trying to do the, the movement of the vector somehow to do it farther. And in the end, it's like, but why am I doing this? I have to focus on, on beautiful projects using every kind of technology. No? So that's, that's uh, I, I'm not focusing on a complex technology now. I'm focusing on how to use the technology to, to cause that uh, emotion. Yeah. For everybody to see, no. Ah, that I think it's it's good. I think it's uh, it's good to at times uh, take a pause and reflect back. But uh, I believe that the knowledge that you shared through your book and even your tutorials. I mean, this is not just one tutorial. You've done so many uh, other tutorials. There's so much work out there. I believe that students will be taking it forward, and many others would be taking forward this thing. Uh, so. Yeah, and, and any other kind of directions for the students to explore your tools? Maybe it's with other parameters that are related to 3D printing as well. Mm, well, I would tell them just to start copying uh, stuff from the, from, the, from the book, from others that they, that, to learn first. And once they can get really real control over it, uh, then they start exploring their own ideas. But 
uh, coping is super important at the beginning because sometimes it happens that you uh, buy the book or any other book and then you say, ah, see, yeah, this is in the book. I want to do something super different. No, no, no. First, learn. For example, Picasso, uh, before Cubism, he was a, real, a painter of reality. So first you have to learn to paint reality. And once you know reality and you can copy reality, then go into your complex stuff. No? So my advice is go slowly, get control over the machine that it takes some time, get some practice and then fly with your own design. Uh -huh. There's also a question from YouTube. Uh, uh, I think the person wants to know using data trees, how can we calculate the distance between adjacent points? It's more of a technical question. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's very easy. Once you have the polyline, no, we, we made a polyline to display the path. That polyline can be exploded. The explosion of a polyline are the straight segments, the lines in between, and you can measure the length of those. Once you have the length of the, the different segments, you can put uh, those lengths into a relationship or a proportion to calculate the most appropriate E value. To know the E value of your machine depends on the nozzle diameter and depends on the layer height. For a bigger nozzle, you need to add more E uh, than for a, a smaller nozzle and also for a bigger layer you have to add more material than if your layer is really thin so you have to find the perfect proportion for that you could start what i recommend is to uh, um, get a file uh, that you have already used for 3d printing anything whatever and read the two lines uh, of g code from one e to the next e and <clears throat> display the points from one line to another. So once you have the points and you have the E value, you can get a proportion between distance of points and the E value and use that uh, proportion to start doing calculating the E in Grasshopper. I don't know if I explained myself that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, of course, that's that's uh, that's the way to uh, go. Mm. Yeah, I don't see any other questions from, ah, yeah. There is, there is something else on YouTube. Uh, chat from Saurav. Saurav, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? Meet up with Professor himself and just. Yes. Uh... Okay, good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hi, hi, Diego. So, my Hello. question uh, is regarding uh, the DFAM. So basically, when we are uh, modeling the parametric models, uh, we have a doubt regarding the contour uh, angles that we have to give. So what is your take on how uh, to give the contour angles? Because what I, I have experienced is uh, with respect to the machine constraints we and also the material constraints. Uh, I especially work with concrete material and um, it was difficult to give um, very difficult contour angle, but I've seen your work and many other works on uh, concrete printing where we have a lot of uh, steep con uh, contour angles. So can you just, uh, throw uh, some view on it? I'm not sure about what you mean with the contour angles. I mean, I the, believe it's the cantilever that you get while printing. Like, what would be the yeah, cantilever? What is the exactly. best kind of? How can you mm. play around with it? Because I. I think the FDM printing allows you to only go up to 45 degree or so. Exactly. And then after that, the material kind of needs a support. So how would you decide on uh, doing more con angle, uh, cantilever angle with yeah. reduced number of supports, right? Yeah. Thank you. No, 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 no. You, that, that depends on the material. Mm -hmm. For example, plastic that uh, hardens as soon as it uh, cools down allows you to go to 45 degrees even a little bit more uh, but clay no with clay you cannot do that because clay uh, after extruding or concrete will be exactly the same it has not hardened uh, nothing basically mm -hmm. so it, it will collapse super easily um, so it depends on the material and some experience for example if you go to, into thingiverse it is super typical to find test mm -hmm. files no, because depending on the material and the machine that you have, you have to make a first test with the different angles and it starts 90, 60, uh, uh, 45, 30, and then you see what's going on with the material. There is no uh, like a rule for that because that depends on the material and the, and the explorations that you, that you have to do. It's, it's part of your 
um, knowledge with the machine during during the work. Yeah, yeah. The, the know how of your of your work in, in the end. Right. Sure. Possibly you could also check out some uh, some research work as well if they are uh, if if there are possibilities of changing the material after a point and adding more kind of adhesives or uh, yeah. quick drying kind of uh, addition to the material. But it really like Diego said, it is about testing and trial and error, yeah. slowing True. down the speed at times and working with your geometries as well. Like you you do not have to do things the way a conventional uh, concrete uh, casting technique has to do because now you have a different tool altogether, right? So you, yeah. can, you can play with the geometry. That's, that's what <clears throat> these tools also allow us to work with. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. could use some strategies. For example, when we 3D print clay, if we know that the piece is going to be too, too big, so it's going to collapse by its own weight or it has some cantilevers, <laughs> What we usually add to the printer is some um, heatings. So when the uh, when the clay it's outside, it starts to dry a little bit. So it creates like a harder shell on the outside. In the inside, it's impossible to to dry out. It has no time enough, and it's more hours. But at least on the outside, it creates like a um, shell, hard shell that uh, capable to to hold the object. And in the end, we can do it like that, for example. No? Yeah. Or or if you would use concrete, maybe you could use any. Uh, uh, you could add any component, any chemicals that maybe would have do it faster, the hardening or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. But definitely that that is one challenging problem with the 3D mm. printing. Uh, uh, sometimes also I, I've seen projects where they've added some kind of sacrificial form work yeah. or certain form work that is just to be placed uh, for the time of printing and one the concrete and clay and all it kind of steps in position and hardens, you can just remove the form work as well. So mm. print on print or print using a certain kind of form work is also interesting to explore. But yeah, right. it's really your <laughs> questions out there uh, which you want to explore further. There yeah. is another one from Gaurav. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Gaurav Goel, my friend Gaurav Goel. Ah, okay. You already know him. Good. Gaurav, do you want to ask uh, your question? You want me to... Uh, it's it's fine. Hi, Diego. Very nice to uh, attend your lecture again. And um, uh, I learned about G-Codes, how to read them. I was just, my particular question is, like today we learned how to design this G-Code. Um, is there a specific advantage to design it for ourselves? Like we've learned softwares like Quora and we have other softwares. So are there some constraints in those softwares uh, that uh, we can benefit uh, by designing it ourselves? Yeah, there, there are some super important benefits uh, because when you control the toolpath, uh, you control the efficiency of the 3D printing. And for example, if you're using a robot arm with a studer of a nozzle of six millimeter, for example, no, you're 3D printing furniture, you don't want the machine to spend 10 extra hours doing the same shape because it creates extra infill, extra path, extra, extra troubles and so on. So you have to be super efficient. And controlling the toolpath creates some time. It, it takes more time because it, 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 is, it is a lot more effort than giving it to Cura. No? But uh, it, it is the only way that I know to really control the process from the beginning till the end to add the most uh, simplicity possible to it and to be the most efficient possible also. So it, it is it is really important when you are also, when you are mainly printing at bigger scale, no? Imagine that you're gonna 3D print a house in concrete and then you give it to Cura, let's say something super weird, you give exactly. it to Cura and Cura tells you that uh, you need uh, um, 1 million, tons of concrete for that because it creates toolpath randomly, blah, 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 and it takes 10 days. But you spend one day controlling the toolpath, doing the toolpath, it's going to be more efficient. You spend less material, a lot less material, and a lot less time, no? So in the end, it's like controlling any kind of industrial process. Uh, like if it would be industry for cars, industry for anything, you need to control every single movement of uh, the machine when you go high, when you go big with uh, with the scale yeah. mainly. Thank you. I just want to add one more question uh, about the E value, which you told. So the E value is the layer thickness 
or uh, like you gave an example of a cuboid like uh, where you go uh, five times in one direction and then you have to go to a third point 10 times so like i'm a bit confused it's uh, like progressing distance or it's the layer height the no. e value <clears throat> the layer height is the value of the contour no so if your contour is every 1 mm that will be the layer height 1 mm because yeah. you're this, you're designing the the path yeah. and so the distance from one layer to another layer is going to be the layer Air height, if, uh, maybe it should be 0 0.2, no, instead of one. If we're talking yeah. about a uh, common 3D printer, and the E value, it's uh, a number that tells the extruder how much it will it has to extrude from one point until the next point. So if this is if this is the distance, maybe it has to extrude two units of material. But if this is the distance, it will have to extrude four. So when it starts in here, uh, it starts extruding, and then it will have extruded four until the last point. Okay. If you have a look at a G code already done with your printer, you will see okay. that the E value is always there. That E value could be uh, two types: could be absolute coordinates on on relative coordinates. On absolute coordinates means that the E starts extruding and then the next length is added to the previous one. So, okay. if you extrude, extrude two first and then you have to extrude four, the value for the second part will be six two plus four. Okay. That means absolute uh, values, but it could be relative values. For example, Prusa, the Prusa printers work with relative values by default, but usually other printers work with absolute values. So if relative means that the extruder is going to tell me the value from point to point and then start again with uh, the value with a fresh value, let's say. So it's going to be two and then four. That's relative. Yeah. If it is absolute, it's two, six. Uh, okay, so you have to have a look at the of a system G code that you have because the QDA or whatever will have created that G code according to the to your machine, and that way you can know also if it is relative or absolute coordinates. You can change it anyway on the G code because probably the firmware of your machine accepts both styles, but uh, in the start protocol there will be an M something. Look, I'm, I'm gonna there is another link. A very useful one uh, that is the G code um, in G code list by. Um, let me let me look for it one second. I will give it to you because that's gonna be very very helpful. <coughs> I'm gonna give it to you on the. Rep wrap G code. And I'm going to share my screen also so you can have a look at it. Let me share it one second. There it goes. If you type in Google or any other one, uh, G code rep wrap, rep wrap is uh, an association of different designers under this name that uh, have a lot of information about 3D printing. They have a wiki about G-code where you can have a look at different uh, codes. They have the list of the most common uh, codes or commands in G-code. So for example, G1 is move, okay? And if you click on G1, G0, G1, it gives you an explanation. These are the, diff the most common um, um, Thin words for, for Prusa, Marlin, etc., and they tell you if they accept or not, or if they include this uh, this command. So G one is linear move, linear, and they explain you how to create it basically. Okay, maybe it's a little more information of what I have just explained, but there they have examples and some other things. So in the list. <clears throat> There you have, um, which one was it? Um, the, ah, here it is. M82 and M83. This is a code that compulsory is going to be in your start protocol 
of your machine and every machine. And if it is M82, the extruder will work with absolute coordinates, means two, six, 10, etc. If it is M83, the extruder will work with relative coordinates. So two, 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 four, two, one, okay? And this way you can know uh, in which mode your firmware is expecting the information, but you can change it. Usually all the machines can work in both, but you have to tell them if it is M82 or if it is M83, or you can adapt your lengths to M82 or M83. It is very easy because if you have to work with relative coordinates, you just read the lengths and those lengths are the values for E. If it is absolute mode, you have to add after lengths mass addition and the mass addition will give you a list of the first value and the second value plus the first and the third plus the second plus the first, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. And thank you for the, I don't think we have more question or we do. Uh, I, I think we do have, we have a question from, from Andrea. Uh, yes. Andrea, you, An want to, Andres. you want to ask you, you want to ask your question, Andrea? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Diego. Uh, I just want to ask you, um, for your point of view, what are the main considerations when you want to print uh, with a robot arm? Uh, to have good luck. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Uh, do, do you have a robot arm? You're, uh, yes, are you expecting our, to? Yeah, it's in our school. In your school? Uh, would you be in charge of it? Is that the question? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, working... in, the, in the same way, you were explaining your, the, the, comp the construction of the points, you have to deconstruct the planes. So in the in which order you add? Uh... Yeah, the, the, the main difference with a robot and a 3D printer is that the 3D printer is locked. I mean, the movement in the 3D printer is locked always to X, Y, and Z, and it cannot move, it cannot rotate. With a robot arm, you have to define not only the points, the point where it has to move, but also with a plane, you have to uh, tell the orientation of the tool of for the robot arm, no? So it's not the same that you print all the time like this, that you start doing this for your print, you know? So the main difference between normal 3D printing with a desktop printer and with a robotic arm is that instead of just coordinates, you have to provide planes. The information of a plane is a little more complex. It's the point, the origin of the point, plus the direction of the normal vector, the vector perpendicular to that plane. With that, you can define the plane with the vector and the origin. And so for robot arms, you have to provide that information. Depending on the robot arm and the brand you're gonna use, you have to mix it in a way or mix it in another way. But uh, that's something that uh, you have to, to learn depending on, on, your, on, on the brand of the robotic arm you're gonna use. For example, I uh, use a plugin for robot arms because so, uh, I don't do it myself. It takes a lot of time for every, so every robot is different. So I use a plugin that I like a lot that is robots. It's a plugin it's a, for Grasshopper is robot by, robots by Vicente Soler. Vicente Soler, uh, the, yeah, I can, I'm going to type it here yeah, for... I believe it's on Food for Rhino. Uh, mm, this one, no, this one is just in, G, in GitHub. Uh -huh. It's in GitHub. It's uh, robots, I'm going to type it, by Bisose, Vicente Soler Serrano. So uh, you ha there are some instructions how to um, install it. And then you have to tell which is the robot that you have, uh, that you can create your own tool. And instead of working with points, it works with something called targets. That is a combination of a point and a vector, so a plane. And there you have to give all the information of the planes for the robot to move, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have one more question from Mohammed. Mohammed. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you very much for uh, yes. the great session. It's a very great to hear. Um, I want to go back to a point where you have talked about the info of the uh, geometry uh, so you can 3D print it. Uh, 
Uh, from this point, I want to I want to know from your uh, knowledge or your point of view. Uh, we mainly consider the design of the outside, and when we start to printing, we face the challenge of it's collapsing. Is there because uh, it's the own weight, especially when trying to three D print with clay. Uh, so I will start to uh, to think if we start to from inside, we need to design the inside before we just uh, design the out shell of the geometry. Uh, and this is what have been driving in my mind lately. Like uh, I stopped starting to design from outside. I start from the inputs from the inside because uh, whenever I go dreamy from the outside geometry, it collapses, especially when I'm trying to print with clay. Uh, so what's more important and uh, and I can't manage it exactly is is the inside. I don't know if this is true or this is uh, this is what happening with my case only. Um, well, uh, every geometry is different. Let's start with that. And every model, it, maybe it has to be adapted, okay? But in general terms, uh, I would start with the interior and then the exterior, okay? Layer by layer. You cannot print, for example, the exterior and then go to the interior because probably the machine will collapse with the exterior. That's obvious, okay? So you, ha you have to go layer by layer, first interior, then the, the exterior. Problems we could have with clay, apart from the collapsing and so on, that if you um, create uh, closed, closed spaces in your model, when you put it into the kiln, that air will become bigger, the molecules of air, and it will make your model explode into the kiln, and it will ruin your model. So careful when you are designing infills for clay, because it could make the model explode into the kiln. That's the first thing. And my advice, if you have problems with the um, with a collision or, or self collision of the of the model of the outer shell, is instead of uh, printing with just one single line for the steel, try to print with double wall or triple wall, because that will make your wall much thicker, and probably it is enough to support the model. But anyway, that's just wondering because every model needs its own study. Yeah. yeah. I, I understand your point. Thank you very much for this. But Thank you, Mohammed. Every, every every time you are, because there is no uh, code or G code generator automatic thing that does the interior for you. So you have to struggle every, with every geometry that you design the environment shape, and you start doing the code all over from the start again. And I don't. I want to ask if there is something to make it easier to design the environment. <clears throat> Depends, because for example, if you're doing always similar models. Uh, always like vases, okay, with a curvy base, but that is always similar. You could make an algorithm to find to make sections of the base, find the points, create the base, blah blah blah, or an interior or an infill or so on. Could I mean, it, or it, obviously, if every model is different, completely different, maybe you have to start from scratch or uh, adapt it a lot, no. From the previous one but if they are similar if you're doing like a family of uh, objects or design or whatever if you create an algorithm for the base or an algorithm for an infill probably uh, it will work on let's say let's say 95 percent on the next model no so yeah what you have to yeah. do is to design the algorithm thinking not only on working on your model but working on similar models maybe that could help yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mohammed. Yeah. I think it, it's a really uh, important point at this uh, uh, junction in uh, in digital tools that we start to even design our own uh, workflows, which act for us almost like our own plugins or other kind of clusters inside Grasshopper. So you're not doing those repeated tasks and making the repeated kind of um, uh, tools and you're not dependent on what's out there as open source material. You're clearly curating your own uh, tools. So I I always have, often tend to uh, <laughs> do that in my practice as well. And I believe that's what uh, 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 Diego is also insisting on that you really need to analyze what what are the tasks that you're doing. Uh, Diego, we have uh, a very active audience today. I know cool. we are a little ahead. <laughs> Uh, from our Sorry. schedule, but we have one last question from YouTube. Um, that's Merit uh, uh, Mert. Mert, sorry, not uh, uh, Mert. Do you need to calibrate the extrusion value of the toolpath for each print? 
for example experimenting the e value calculated for uh, e is as e, e as o uh, seems different than the potter bot uh, i maybe uh, yeah these, these are two uh, tools for clay printing yeah so those, are, those are those are Two yeah. two brands of uh, 3D printers for clay, the ESAO and and the pot, uh, Potterbot. Uh, no, I mean the E will be different depending on basically those two parameters: the nozzle diameter and the layer height. If you have uh, two machines, one ESAO and one Potterbot, that have exactly the same nozzle diameter, and you're asking to 3D print the same object with the same layer height they should have the same proportion for the E value. Unless that, uh, no, it, they should be the same. Uh, the only difference could be that one calculates it uh, as um, relative and the other as absolute. That could be the only difference, but they should be the same according to, to my experience. I have an ASL, an ASL one to test it. And for example, it works with the same values that uh, the WASP that I have also. So I, I don't have Potterbot. Maybe there is something different, but it shouldn't. Anyway, if uh, well, uh, you have problems uh, with that, what you can do is to compare to file to G codes created with an app for those machines and see if there is any difference. But um, to me, it makes no logic something uh, unless there is something on the firmware that needs a different proportion, but I think it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Anyway, if you have doubts, ask the ask the developers because they will be super happy to 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 explain you what could be the proportion for e-value. So you ask yes, how they are super kind and they always answer and potter what and, and those things. Okay. <laughs> I believe uh, she got the answer. She or her, uh, him got got the answer. So, uh, Lamila, uh, now back to you. Just to say final thanks and uh, just to make the final announcements. Uh, Diego, thank, thank you. So thank, much. you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Bablin, and thank you, Diego, for this very detailed explanation and uh, the mystification of the movement of the <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> It's not magic, it's science. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we, I really much look forward to see what you will do with the emotion and how you will demystify the emotions you mentioned that as your next, next project. So thank you very much and thank you audience uh, on YouTube, especially the ones who register and uh, follow this great tutorial. So if you miss something, we will post the, the, the uh, uh, tutorial on our YouTube channel. If you uh, like to learn more about uh, distributed consciousness, by uh, Memo Acton, so you can join us tomorrow. Uh, we, I also would like to repeat from the beginning, uh, 5th of October is a Dali Mid Journey and Dream Studio, Young Talk. 28th of October, we have the uh, Spanish talk, Relevance on Emerging Technologies in uh, uh, Latin America. We also have the Portuguese talk, uh, Digital Urbanism, and uh, by the uh, 21st of October, you can uh, submit your uh, work for the next young call, which is about experimental 3D printing with the custom material, something uh, related to what we are. Maybe someone will check and maybe try what we learned uh, today and uh, apply for, for this young talk. So please, uh, Diego, also you can mention to your, your students we, about this young call and sure. I'm quite, quite sure they will have uh, uh, many things to, to, to show us. So thank you once more. Thank you, Bavlin, and thank you, uh, the others, and special thanks to my friend, Diego. Thanks, Lamila and Bavlin. Thank thanks you. a lot. Thank you. Welcome.